with Karen Montanaro and me, Deborah Henson Conant, also known as Deborah Henson Conant, also known as DHC. I asked Karen to have this conversation with me that we've been having for about 30 years. Would you say, Karen? Yep. And the, the conversation is kind of about everything, but I, if I had to put, if we had to put it, I would say it's about arts, it's about education, and you said it's about stealing back our souls from? The merchant economy. And actually I didn't use the word soul because it's kind of suspect oh. in the scientific community. Okay, I said, shall, I, shall I change it to spirit? We're, no, we're, uh, well, uh, you, you can do whatever you want, but uh, we're stealing back our most original organic impulses from well, the merchant economy. Okay, I'll put spirit for the moment here. Yeah, I mean, it's the same. Okay, all right. Okay, actually, I didn't say that. So let's say it again. Say that again. Stealing Steal back our most original impulses from the merchant economy. Okay, so we've been talking about this for a long time. And I want to just give a, just a, a little bit of context. So my teacher, my my mentor, and your mentor as well is Tony Montanaro. You ended up marrying him, um, and be, and now you're Karen Montanaro. And when T Tony died at his funeral, at, at, at his memorial, I was sitting up in the balcony, and you were down in the spotlight, and you said, Tony, I don't know exactly what you said. Tony is not dead. He's in here. And I looked at you and I said, okay, that's where I'm going to go get Tony. And so I called you up and I said, I want to work with you. And that started our conversation that we've been having for since that moment. So um, what would you like to say? I mean, you've been thinking about this a lot and you're, I mean, I say who you are. I'm a composer and a performer and who are you? And just so people know, and um, where does this fit in your life, this idea? So I was a professional ballet dancer. As soon as I uh, graduated from high school, I got on the bus. I went to New York City. I had big dreams of becoming a professional ballet dancer. And I crashed and burned that first year in New York. It was very hard. But before I completely fell apart, I had auditioned for a, a professional ballet company and I got the job. Um, so then I, I was a professional ballet dancer for 10 years. Um, I thought my life was just charmed. I mean, I had never been so happy. Um, and then things started to go wrong, like uh, weird psychological things crept up on me. I started to have anxiety uh, attacks, um, you know, at the height, at the height of my happiness. I remember that first anxiety attack. I was on a subway in New York City. We were touring. You know, the Ohio Ballet was was performing at Brooklyn Academy of Music, and I had a panic attack on the subway. And um, to make a long story short, um, the next few years were brilliant, and then these attacks would happen, uh, panic, depression. I was definitely anorexic. Um, and... Uh, I had a few more years in the in the uh, ballet world, and then AIDS broke out, um, and my dearest friends were dying, and I started to really investigate this phenomenon of why are they dying, you know, and um, and I uh, that's a whole long story, but I got so interested in this scientific quest that I was on, and I was researching it from a medical point of view. And by then I was dancing in Germany. So it was really about, you know, I wasn't bombarded with a bunch of information. I could really think about what I was learning. So I decided to go to medical school and, and cure AIDS because I had a, a very, I'm sure that I had a legitimate approach that even pertains to COVID now, but it's very off the beaten trail of, of science. So I, I went home, I was going to apply to medical schools and the local ballet company, the Portland Ballet, um, asked me to do their Nutcracker. And I was 27 years old. I was still a very capable ballet dancer and I still loved it. Wait, is that old for a ballet dancer or young? for a, that Yeah, that's about the time when, when we retire, you know, so I, I gave it up at 27. I was 
I'm ready to retire from this world of ballet. I'm ready to go into the medical profession. You know, I'm ready to be a doctor or it's certainly a research scientist um, because I have real ideas here, you know. So it just so happened that while I was uh, rehearsing for the Nutcracker, um, I learned that they had hired this man named Tony Montanero, who uh, was quite well known in the mime world and certainly in Maine. He was famous. Ballet companies are always struggling. They need a, a box office draw. So they hired Tony. So we're getting close to the performance and all of a sudden the, the members of the first cast and the members of the second cast are in the same studio. And I was excited, you know, here's this kind of famous guy who's coming in. Um, uh, Tony was 60 years old at the time. I was 27. And the story goes, I don't really know when he saw me first, but he will say, he said that he was there in the studio and I walked in. Uh, I did not look like a ballet dancer when I walked in. I was wearing my L.L. Bean boots and I big, 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 you know, coat. And I walked in and Tony immediately asked the person who was standing next to him, who the hell is that? <laughs> um, so he proposed the second time we were ever in the same room. I was frightened. I mean, this, this was, this was way too much for a, a inexperienced, you know, even though I had been a professional ballet dancer and toured the world, uh, dancing professionally, I was inexperienced in love. I was a virgin. What? Whoa, wait, you were a virgin? <laughs> At 27 before Tony? No, and everybody, for anybody who's watching this, so Tony was my teacher. I was in, uh, you know, classes with him. I was, he was the person who helped me, um, you know, shift out of the mindset of what a harp is to open up my mind to what it is. So my experience of Karen and Tony is, is clearly Tony falls in love and I'm seeing him differently one day because he's, he has come alive. Um, but you, but you are what made him come alive. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> that was the, that was the weirdest thing in the world to see this guy go through this transformation. And he, Tony was unlike anybody I ever met before because he was utterly transparent. You know, if any guy had been attracted to me before, and I would feel a little bit of something too. All of a sudden, we would go into these mind games, you know, where he was, boom, and I, you know, and I would, whoop, and there was no way I, I wanted that. You know, it was just too weird. You know, what are you thinking? What? So Tony propose, proposes the second time we're in the, in the same room, he um, starts losing weight and talking about it, you know, like, I'm going to get in shape. And he starts, and there was one day. Um, Can we when, describe Tony for a moment? Can you describe that he's this little Italian guy? with a little an, Italian guy with a huge nose, but quite attractive. I mean, I did not find him attractive when I was 27 and he was 60. Um, but once I fell in love with him, he was like the standard of what attractive. But it took and, nine and months for that to happen. With a, hu a huge, huge personality with a huge connection to himself. And I, I realize this is going off in just a sort of a bio biographical, but but it's but for me, it's fascinating. So I mean, if, you, if people are enjoying this, stay, stick around. It's a story of love that we're talking about now. Tony is my teacher. If you know anything about me, you've heard me talk about him. He's a mime. He was a mime, but he didn't wear white face. And he talked and his work, he called his work physical eloquence. Yeah. And he had a very hard time explaining what he, what he did. Um, so I, yeah, you say this is a story about love, but the now after Tony died, I'm realizing that love is much more than just a personal feeling between two people. Um, the reason why, uh, first of all, the reason why I even let him into my very, you know, safe environment, you know, it, I, I call it safe, but it was actually killing me. 
uh, the comfort zone was, you know, if you, if you think of the comfort zone as this, you know, it was shrinking. It was shrinking to, to the essence of technique. I was hiding in the ballet world. I was hiding everything about me that feeds the soul. I was strictly training myself at the physical level and thinking that my self-worth had to do with my weight. You know, I was, so if my weight went up two pounds, oh my God, depression. If my weight started to go down two, two pounds, okay, I'm on the right track. Got to keep it going down, going down, going down, going down. This, this is how your life shrinks in the ballet world at the time in the 80s. Um, my comfort zone had to do with how high I could get my leg, how many pirouettes I could do. It was all based on relative values. So ach achievement um, uh, based on others and, um, and numbers that... Um, Yes, it was all based on comparative and relative values. You know, it was not based on anything absolute. You know, I didn't even think in those terms. So when Tony said, you should express yourself when you move, that was a brand new thought, you know, uh, which blows my mind now because since I, I met Tony, that was all about who are you and how do we free your most organic impulses? So let, oh. let's go back for a minute because you're talk. So when, so we've talked about technique, and we've talked about how technique should support the expression of oneself. Now you were someone who had a great deal of technique, and you, I'm assuming, you didn't even know how to identify or distinguish the self, the expression of yourself. How did you start finding the self to express? Okay, so um, here's here's how it happened. Uh, so I went to see Tony perform. All right, so this is this is when I'm I'm you know I'm still functioning in the world quite proficiently because I'm a good performer, um, but I'm having periodic attacks of anxiety, depression, and really having a hard time waking up some mornings. Like, can I just ask you a little bit more about those attacks? Like, can you share, how did they present? Like, how did they, what did you, what were you thinking? What were you doing? What did, what did, what, like, how would I know that you were having one of those attacks? Would I? Well, um, they got more and more severe as, okay. um, as uh, time went on from, from that time in the, in the, the subway, um, they started to be more severe. And interestingly with each, uh, episode, I learned something myself that brought me out of, of that attack. So, uh, so what was in, what was in the attack where, where, if you were in the attack, it was, it was the power of suggestion. The first okay. one on the subway, um, was, uh, I was performing, you know, I, I, I had just taken a class at the Joffrey Ballet School. You know, my old friends who had seen me about 25 pounds heavier are now looking at you know, a real somebody who who could compete professionally in the in the dance world, and they're all just giving me, loading me with compliments, watching me a lot, and I was doing triple pirouettes, four pirouettes. I was, you know, I was feeling like on the top of my game. Um, I was, I had a lot of money because we were touring, and I had been a professional ballet dancer for a few months now, and I had per diem, and so I had money in my pocket. I had gone shopping, I was wearing new clothes, and I was sitting on this subway thinking, I have made it. I have made it. This is, I am, I can't believe how happy I am right now. The subway car stopped halfway between two stations. And I'm sitting there and I'm just feeling great. And I'm thinking, you know, some people get nervous in situations like this. Whoosh. My body was suddenly, it was the power of suggestion. My body was suddenly flooded with adrenaline. Okay, now I had to, that's, okay. So the first time I came out of that attack was simply because the subway, the train started moving again, right? And I was fine, right? I didn't really think back to that. The next time was when I was working in Germany and, um, and, I was working on my AIDS theory, which was taking so much, oh my God, I'm really getting something. And 
that morning, the German uh, dance schedule, you go in in the morning, you work from 10 to, to lunchtime. You go home, you have this huge Mittagspause, this break in the middle of the day. And then you come back to do, do, the, do the more rehearsal and go on stage. That morning, all, you know, we're, all we're doing is learning a new piece. Okay, brand new steps. I, I have the lead, you know, which I did at the, in this company. So I'm learning these new steps. I go back. I forget everything. I just start working on the AIDS thing. Then I go back for rehearsal. I've forgotten all the steps from the morning. I have a major panic attack. Like, I, I, I you know, the, the director can't put any more steps on me. I'm just saying, I'm sorry, Franz. I, I, I don't know what's going on, but I, and I left. He he said, "Okay, just go home. Go home. You know, take care of yourself." I that morning, you know, I just went back into my um, apartment, my little tiny apartment with a mattress on the floor, and I felt like there was a monster in my room. I mean, I felt there was a snarling beast. It was it was insanity. It was there with me. The threat of insanity. And oh, so the threat of insanity was a snarling beast. Yeah, so, it was very clear. So yeah. when it sounded like, like in the first instance, it almost sounded like you checked off all the, like che I've checked off all the boxes for my life. Yes, I've checked off all the boxes. And then, and then, and then there you're sitting on the train and suddenly realizing there's nothing in the box. You've checked off all the boxes. And, and you're, you're, you're the way you just articulated that reminds me of what I've learned that in in that instance you know when i ticked off all the boxes this was one really strong wing you know i've started to think in terms of wings that we have two wings so this wing was we, we can't see it oh, here wait a second let me let me get all let me just make you i think i hopefully i won't disappear forever if i do this Okay, now you can show us your wings, I hope. Yeah, yeah. so this wing, which is actually my left wing, even though it's coming up on the right side, my left wing is the part of me that's in the world. This is based on my comparative, relative value in the world. And it's all about my technique. It's all about how I compare with other people. It's all about how my body works, you know? So th that wing, at this time where I realized that this wing was fully expressed, this other wing manifested as um, completely neglected. I did not know what was going on, but it was definitely uh, a um, complete flip over and um, uh, a death. It was, it, it was like dying. I mean, I, it was awful. So wait a minute. How do you? I'm. I'm. Um. Okay. I'll come on first. I think. What? Nope. No. We both both have to be on. Oh, there we are. Um. All right. You said it's like a death. How do you know? I mean, meaning like, how do we know what's like a death? What was like a death about it? Uh. Well. Um. You. You. You have such good things. Um. I think death itself, you know, that that we know nothing about. I am not afraid of that. <laughs> you know? And um, but this was um, the abyss. You know, the abyss is where you are standing over something that has no bottom. And and uh, and to me, that is way worse than going through a physical death. You know. Um, oh. My understand. So I, all, I've also at about thirteen or fourteen had this intense panic attack, which stayed with me, you know, repeatedly. It was all about the abyss, and sometimes it still visits me. Um, yes. So, and to me, that is death. Not the, the not the act of dying, but the the foreverness and and in, in yeah the infinite abyss of it. From, yes. well, and from what I know, what do I know? And there's a, a phrase in the very beginning of the Bible that has always interested me. Like, what does this mean? Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Of the deep? Yes. 
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. When Tony was diagnosed with um, terminal cancer, he was drugged, and he didn't know what was going on. And I was alone with this information. And I went into that. I was on the abyss at that point. I got home to my house. I had a, I could not turn on the light. The light was, I was grunting. I was like double over groaning. Oh, you know, like that. I could not fathom that this man was going to die. This man who had saved me from the, the brink, you know, who had brought me into this world of his and strengthened my other wing that had been that badly neglected. Now he's gone. And I stood, you know, first of all, I wanted to just rip off all my clothes and run in the woods. But then I knew I would hurt my feet. I mean, this is the practical side of things. So then actually the first thing I wanted to do was listen to Christian science hymns, you know, because that's what we had been doing. We had been practicing Christian science and I, Got my flashlight out because I was having this, oh no, I can't have light. Light was just, it would have rubbed all my nerves in the wrong way. So I took my flashlight, right? And I get my boom box. You know, this was 2001, 2000. We didn't have all this technology, you know. So I get my boom box and I get a Christian science cassette tape, you know, with hymns. I sit next in the rocking chair. I put the thing in, boom, boom, boom. It starts playing and I go, <clears throat> I turned it off immediately because I heard technique. <laughs> I did not want to hear technique. I wanted to hear a croaky Quaker woman singing from the depths of her soul. Any technique at that moment. I mean, talk about these two wings. I needed the absolute. I needed somebody who was had nothing. So that did not work. Then I wanted to take off my clothes and run in the woods. No, nope, feet are going to hurt. Next, I just went into the um, shower. Still, the lights are all off. I'm standing in the shower. The water's coming down on me. And I start having a dialogue with myself. Or I call it the voice, capital V, dialogue. Would you be having this reaction if you found out Tony was having an affair with someone? Right? good question. And I said, yes, I would be having this same reaction because, and in fact, it might even be worse because I know that Tony is such a good hearted golden, you know, soul person that he would still want to take care of me. Like he would still feel, he would feel sorry for me. You know, he would come over, do you need some help, you know, taking out the garbage or fixing something. And then he'd want to go back to the other woman. Oh my God, that would that would just kill me. So I'm I'm realizing there's a little bit of selfishness stuff going on here because you know it's really all about you. And then and then it occurred to me that that phrase, you know, I also I realized that even if the medical profession called back and said, Oh, I'm sorry, we got Tony's um results mixed up, you know, he's really fine. Um I was afraid that I had gone a little bit too deep into the abyss to come back because Tony's going to die sometime. And chances are he's going to die before I do because he's 34 years older than I am. So I thought, I'm really going down now. I may just not come back from this panic. And that's when my, my question from since I was a child, what does it mean, darkness upon the face of the deep? And I thought, this is it. Darkness is upon the face of the deep. And then the next thought came. This is the beginning of life. It's not the end. Say more about that. Well, it didn't comfort me. Um, but this, but since I had been studying Christian science, and it really is a science. You know, I'm much more of a science person than I am a religion person. Religion, organized religion, I think, has made a mess of everything. And it drives me crazy that this concept of God has been almost monopolized by, by organized religion because it's really bigger. <laughs> so so uh, in the book of Genesis, about the beginning, there are seven days of creation that is very different from the Adam and Eve story. You know, So these seven days are 
mysterious. They are, and even at the end of the seven days, it says, um, this is what happened before anything was in the world. Before, before, before time, before space, before anything you know, before even you know who you are. This is a, like a spiritual blueprint, not for the physical world, but for the spirit, for creativity. This, I think, to be in the creative process teaches you more about the beginning than either, either creationism or the Big Bang or Darwinism or any of these things that you have to think about. No, creation is an experience. Okay, let's go back to this. And okay, so you say, um, and of course, I'm always aware that when we're reading a book like the Bible, this is a translation. So we don't know what it actually originally said. And maybe the people who wrote it didn't know exactly what it said. So I'm aware of that. But it doesn't matter. It because doesn't matter. Our, right, because our interpretation is what opens up something to us. So something is opened up to you. And you are saying, this is the blueprint for creative expression, for creative um, existence, what the blueprint? Yes. Of what? Yes, uh, this is the blueprint of the creative mind. You know, um, what is so, a creative mind? All right, so the creative mind is that which manifests something that has never been in the world before. Okay, so if you look at if you look at um, the miracle of, of who you are, as opposed to who I am, you find out that we, all the intelligence in the universe, and even, even uh, atheistic uh, scientists will say there's a, something intelligent going on here. You know, all the intelligence in the universe is invested in you, right? Um, we are just as mysterious as the Big Bang, or why, you know, looking, Looking at a fly, right? A buzzy, 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 buzzy fly. It lands on the ceiling, right? Why? Do, how does it stick on the ceiling? Why doesn't it fall? You know, I mean, if you start, if you start opening your eyes to these things, you will find, oh my gosh, if you are at all thinking you know what's going on, forget it. You know, the only way you know what's going on is when your heart is exploding with, <gasps> you know, and, and we are that, I mean, we get into this world, you know, here's this strong wing, you know, we make a lot of money, we can, poor, poor Simone Biles, I mean, she can launch into the air, I mean, watch her jump and you are watching a force of nature, you know, and she drops out of the Olympics because, because, oh my God, I understand. <laughs> I mean, people, because, because a lot of people don't have the gumption to find out what makes them tick, you know, what makes you tick? No, they find, okay, Oh, all of a sudden I'm attracted to so-and-so. Oh my God, this is making you tick, right? Okay, okay, I, no, sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble pulling us up and down. Okay, all right, so you've said two really big things. You've talked about the blueprint of, uh, cre of the creative mind, and now you're talking about this makes you tick. Wh and what did you say, yeah. what, what makes us tick? Um, when your heart, okay, so when your heart burns, within you oh, God. burns or bursts burns oh. bursts tickles you know when i when i saw tony for the first time that was when my heart uh leaped you know and it wasn't a burn you know it was um i sat there and watched this 60 year old guy come out on stage all right so here i am i'm i'm just going to this show because that's what i do i am a cultured person and I support my fellow cast members. And I am sitting in this little 80 seat theater, little black box theater. And Tony comes out on stage. He's 60 years old. He's going through a divorce. He is not happy in his life. He's overweight and he's wearing spandex. <laughs> it is not a good idea. 
you know, he, when he would turn around, you could see the jock strap through his, you know, pants. There was a little indentation, nice, neat little indentation outline of a jock strap. <laughs> and he's growing his hair long because he's just trying to find out the meaning of life. You know, hair's long, slick back. He's 60 years old. It's not a good look. Then I'm 27. I know how to look good. <laughs> but then Tony starts moving. I could not believe what was, uh, I, I couldn't believe what he was doing. Now, I mean, I felt, okay, so this, this image was even as sharp as the snarling uh, monster in my room in, in Germany when I was having that panic attack years before. This, this image was just as clear as that. I felt pink champagne bubbles in the middle of my bones. They were, they were, I was, I was having a kind of happiness that I had never felt before, right? And, you know, my conscious mind is not understanding this. All I know, I went up to Tony after the show and I said, I have to know what you're doing. My soul knew that I needed to go in this direction, that he had something to teach me that I had never learned before, that had been utterly neglected in all of my educational experiences. I needed to know something. And so here's, here's how that happened. A week later, we were sitting in his living room and I said, Tony, teach me something. You know, I'm desperate. I didn't say that, but I know it. Teach me something. Okay, he said, stand up. I stood up. And he said, do a move, do a move. <laughs> I'm a professional ballet dancer. I mean, I have a daunting movement vocabulary. <laughs> I could spin, I could pirouette, I could lift my leg, I could leap so that my crotch was lower than my leg, my, my legs, you know? I mean, I could do anything, but I knew, again, here's the, the wisdom, the intelligence, that was planted in those first seven days of creation, the intelligence telling me that none of those moves are gonna help you now. You have to let a move rise up from the unpredictable, unfamiliar, unexplored parts of yourself, a move that only you could do right here and right now, a move maybe you'll never wanna do again, but you have to do this move right now. And I panicked. It was not, you know, a, a full-blown panic attack. This was the reason I had had all those panic attacks. This was the subliminal little thing that was saying, you're afraid of your own originality. But I didn't, but that at that moment, that fear was up. It was right in front of my face. It was pushing me down. It was saying, Karen, don't move. Don't move. You're going to regret it. You know, you're going to look stupid. Just do one of your pirouettes, do one of your moves and get it over with. That's all this teacher asked you, right? But the yes voice, so the no voice from the world was pressing down. The yes voice from my spirit was pressing up. And if you look at the second uh, day in, in creation story in, in the Bible, this is very much the water above the earth and the water below the earth and the water above is turned around. Uh, sorry, I get off in the intellectual okay. side. Of it. Well, and I'm, anyway. I'm worried about it. But I'm just going to close the window so that buzz is not there. I'll be right back. Don't stop. Just okay. Please. Okay. Um, were you just smelling your armpit? <laughs> you know, my sister, my sister bought me um, underarm shields, and I have them on. But they're... so I just want you to know, we're still alive, even <laughs> though I went to the. Like this is act. This is a broadcast, which is great. So just, to, I just want to say that for years. <laughs> Well done. Oh, you're blushing. I love it. <laughs> For years, 
Karen and I have had these conversations in a kitchen, in a studio. And every time we have these conversations, I'm like, damn, I'm the only person hearing this. How is that possible? How can I? And I would always stand very, very, very still and just kind of like, if I don't say anything, she'll just keep going. <laughs> so um, <laughs> here I go. All right. Well, um, all right. So you are. So there you are. Um, and, and, and I just, oh, it's almost noon. Oh, we have to leave. That's okay. I, I just, I'm almost at the end of this story. Okay. I, okay. This is a great place to just tie it up in the pirate. Okay. Sense. Yeah, okay. So, um, Actually, before you finish, I want to say that at the same time, I was going to Tony in desperation with my instrument and basically saying, teach me something. Teach me to under teach me to break out of the 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 prison that I have made of of how I engage with this instrument. So we're yeah. we're we're reaching out to him the same way. So carry on. Yeah. In other words, you were asking him to strengthen your other wing, which pertains to your originality. It pertains to Deb Deborah. Mm -hmm. You know not your technique and not how you compare in the world and not how much money you make and all these relative values that do cling to us, you know, that there is a good side to that, but only if you're um, strengthening your other wing. So that this moment uh, when I, uh, the yes voice started to, um, it was like a volcano. It was saying, come on, Karen, you can do this, do this original move. And uh, the move I did, I let this, first of all, I let the yes voice gather momentum and energy because I knew my life depended on it. I didn't know it at the time, but it did. I think I did know it somewhere. But um, so the move that I did eventually, and it really did surprise me because I was not planning it or anything. I just went like this, right? And I bent my knees down to the floor and I came back up, still doing it. That, that move took about three seconds, maybe four. And by the time I straightened my legs, I, what, my face was as red as it just was now, you know, <laughs> smelling my armpit. I mean, I was completely undone. I felt, I was so embarrassed. I grabbed Tony uh, because he had already proposed. So I, you know, I knew he didn't, wouldn't mind. And I, um, I said, Tony, I've forgotten how to play. And that's all I knew at that time. But um, eventually I did fall in love with him. I toured with him for 15 years. I took every single one of his classes, whether he was teaching in an elementary school or teaching at the Celebration Barn. Um, or teaching, uh, you know, anything. I, I was with him all this time. And slowly, I, the, the, um, I started to get more and more uh, strength in my other wing. In other words, I started to reclaim all the organic impulses that had been usurped or demeaned, diminished, uh, devalued by the merchant economy world you know, that only values your relative value and your comparative value. Or that give, gives you that to, to devalue yourself by, and then we, then we, then we lose that, the, the other value. Yeah. And nobody taught, taught me that, you know, it's, it's a yeah. subliminal, that's why it's, that's why it's the source of a lot of anxiety and depression and uh, eating disorders. It's a subliminal cultural appropriation of our creative mm -hmm. mind. And that's why I can see that you could check off all the boxes and what you were doing. Every box was removing your connection from, from, from yourself. Exactly. So that when you have checked them all off, I can understand how that would bring you to that, the, the yes. consciousness of the emptiness. Yeah. yeah. It was an extreme moment of imbalance. You know, when I felt like I was at the top of the world, I was clinging, you know, I love this um, illusion of going up, 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 and you climb, 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 you get to the top. It's not attached to anything. You know, it, and that's what it is. If, you're, if your self-worth is, and I, I say in my talk about arts and education, I say, it doesn't matter if it's a test score or a video game score, how well you play the piano or how many followers you have on you know, uh, social media, Instagram, as long as your self-worth is at all relative, you suffer from a life-threatening disease. And 
I mean, it's normal. If you if you w lose, I mean, I saw the Dutch soccer team and the Olympics lose, and I my heart went out to them. You know, it's 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 normal to feel bad if you lose. I mean, it's good. I mean, the competitive stuff is great, but you need to spend, um, and you need to have moments like uh, watching Tony perform. You need to have moments. And you, you have a song about this. And next right. time we talk, I really would love you to talk about that, that, recite that, that you have to have moments that take your breath away. And that's when the your absolute value, so we have a relative value, we have an absolute value. That absolute value is revealed. Again, let there be light, first day of creation is revealed in moments that have an absolute value to you. Watching Tony perform that first time was the first time I was in touch with my absolute value. It was the first time I, I was in touch with it. You know, Emily Dickinson talks about it when she says, when I feel physically, you know, it's a physical thing. It takes your whole body. When I feel physically that the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. So yes, poetry is words on a page, but poetry is also your personal experience of yourself. And that's why we need all the arts because the arts will fine tune those inner chords so that you'll know when the full symphony plays. And for me, that was watching Tony for the first time. Karen, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing this. Um, I, I love this conversation. I've loved it for 30 years. And I'm thank you for having it with me in, you know, in the experiment of being a, a public. Um, so um, let's have it again. And let's keep talking about this. Just, what? I need better underarm protectors. Yeah, just wear nothing. Uh, well, you can wear what you want to wear, but I mean. Yeah, well, purple looks good on me, but all right. Yeah, oh. that's true, but, but, but it doesn't matter. I mean, we get to sweat too, right? Yes, especially when we're talking about something meaningful. I mean, you that's part of what's so profound. And that's in the song you're talking about. It, 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 um, the the Unitarian choir. Um, um, it's about a, a choir that sings so terribly. Th their their voices sound like the cracks in a plastic veneer. But when they sang, you know, it felt like heaven couldn't wait to hear. And then the line that you've always asked me about is uh, when when once you've heard the angels sing, no matter where or when, your heart will beat at the walls of your life, longing to hear it again. And for me, you know, for me, hearing and you talked about it. You talked about when you wanted to hear the 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 truth of the human voice, and I don't mean speaking voice. The truth of the human, and and the emptiness that you had experienced without the truth of the human. And then when you saw it in Tony, not in the body of Tony, but in the movement of Tony being the act of being alive and engaging right that, that 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 is what moved you and um and here and i'm bringing all this back to underarm protections or whatever is that mm -hmm. is that we so i do obsess about all these things and in fact the angels sing through our not the things that through when we connect with ourselves technique or not technique, but that thing that you did when you could you do anything, you know, acrobatic, but when you did something that was just a human thing and it was so, so profound and so humiliating because it was so visible. Yes. And people will see that, you know, they really do see the spirit that informs what you do. Um, because I've done the same kind of thing. Sometimes, sometimes I'll do something, one thing, and it really just goes, Whoa. and then I'll, I think, oh, it's that's that's then, it. That's the you thing. Know? And then you and try I'll do it again, and it doesn't have any wa, because right. it, it doesn't come from the same place. It right. comes from my ego, 
you know, my, right. my wanting to be successful and have something that I can depend on, which is your technique, you know, not to discount that you, I don't, I don't put anybody who wants to do ballet without technique, forget it. I, I don't even take you, you know, I can love you as a person. I can love your spirit, but no, you've got to be technically okay. You know? And thus will I never do ballet, but let us end um, mm -hmm. Let us end on this note. And Karen, thank you for this conversation. I really can't wait for the next one. I hope that the people who've watched have gotten something um, that it gave you a new idea, that it gave you a new insight, that it gave you new hope, that it gave you new questions. And um, and I love, I love being able to share this conversation. So I will now hit the button that says end, and I'll look forward to the next time.